We come because we honor and adore you, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for you woke us up this morning in our right mind with the movement of our limbs and all of our senses working properly, Lord. You gave us breath this morning, Lord. And Father God, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you because you brought us together another day, Lord. Oh, Father, so that we may give you honor, glory, and praise. And Father God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you are doing in our lives, Lord. How you're protecting us through this coronavirus season. Oh, Father God, for we know that it will pass, Lord. And Father God, we thank you, Lord, and we ask that you be with those, Lord, that are sick and shedding, Lord. Members of Miracle Temple, Lord. Brother Deshaun Jefferson, Lord. Sister Lily McFadden, Lord. Mother Williams, Lord. Oh, Father, Mother Strowman, Lord. We just ask that you continue to be with them, Lord. Continue to keep your hand on them, Lord. Restore them, Lord. Oh, Father God, we thank you and ask that you do this for us, Lord. Father God, because we know that you will, Lord. And Father, for those families, Lord, that have lost loved ones recently, Lord, we just ask that you be with them, Lord. Give them comfort strength and peace, Lord. Oh, Father God, because we know that it is difficult times when you lose a loved one, Lord. But Father God, we know that you know best, Lord. We just pray that they're with you, Lord. And Father God, we thank you for this. And Father God, we come to worship you and praise you this morning, Lord, for all that you do, Lord. And Father God, we're going to give you all the honor, glory, and praise because we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we're not going to trust in our own understanding, Lord, but in all our ways, we're going to acknowledge you, Lord, for you know we, you will direct our path. And Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, because your mercies are new every day, Lord. So Father God, we give you honor, glory, and praise this morning, Lord, and ask that you come into this place, Lord, and that you have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let him eat at home, 
that ye come not together unto them into condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. The word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everybody. Is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Come on, let's just clap our hands and give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. We are a friend of God. We call him friend. Feel free to stand up and to clap your hands and to rejoice and praise the Lord with us because that's why we're here. We're here to magnify him, to lift up his holy name. Oh, you are my full of me. 
been so good to all of us. I didn't have a good idea.
glad that he's here. It feels much better when God's presence is in the house. When God is here, everything that we need is here. Our healing is here. Our deliverance is here. Our breakthrough is here. Whatever you need from the Lord, it's in the atmosphere. I wish you would just lift up your hands right now and just by faith, whatever it is that you need from God, just grab it right now out of the atmosphere as it was. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Whatever it is, it's yours for the asking. Praise God. God bless you all today. I'm so grateful to God for another Sunday. In fact, this is the last Sunday of 2021. Hallelujah. The last Sunday, first Sunday of this year. Amen. Somebody said, is this the last Sunday? No, this is the last first Sunday. <laughs> Experience and uh, 
uh, we'll be able to go on from there. This is all a part of our desire and prayer that God will bless our church and move us forward um, into our future. So uh, please be in prayer for us in that regard. I want to say thank you to everyone who uh, participated on this week uh, from Monday all the way up until yesterday. I uh, call it Ministry Week. Um, on Wednesday night, we did something a little different outside of our normal prayer on Wednesday, and we did a teaching on motivation for ministry. Uh, motivation for ministry, talking about love as the motivation for ministry. And um, all of our ministries, we have just changed to our, reduced down rather to five ministries in the church. And so we, we no longer are looking at 15 or 16 ministries. We're looking at five ministries in our congregation. Amen. And that is our men's ministry, our women's ministry, youth ministry, Christian education, and helps ministry. These five ministries will be uh, assigned the task and the leadership teams for each one of them will be assigned the task of ensuring that the vision and mission of our church is propagated and goes forward. And so every single one of those teams, I have been able to sit down with them respectively and have conversation and get clarity and answer questions um, in regard to our plans for next year. So everyone who's on those teams know. And so please do not say no if someone asks him to recruit you to help and to serve in the ministry. Amen. 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 I see some of the faces, but I said it. <laughs> yes, yes, I said it. Um, if we're going to uh, grow, if we're going to grow, if we're going to be the kind of church that God wants us to be, then we have to have a spirit of service. Amen. We want to serve. And we're not serving ourselves. We're serving God, and we're serving each other. And so as we go forward in these ministries, we want to get everybody that can and will to participate, to support, um, so that we can really do greater work for God. And the task is to not just do work in the house, but get outside the house and to start ministering to our community. And so these five ministries will be tasked with that along with many other things. And so please be in prayer for them, the leaders, the presidents of those ministries. Be in prayer for all of them as they seek to fulfill the vision that God has given to our church. Uh, on uh, December 11th, uh, first let me say this, December the 10th, um, I'm asking everyone to um, participate um, on that Friday night at 7 o'clock p.m., our jurisdiction, Eastern New York First uh, jurisdiction, our leader is Bishop James Pullings, is asking for all of the churches in our jurisdiction, which number to about 80 some odd churches or so, to come together as we celebrate the 100th year of the jurisdiction. Uh, we have already submitted our ad for our church, uh, which will be displayed in the Souvenir Journal. But our presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, Bishop J. Drew Shear, will be the special guest speaker on that evening. It will be held at the historic First Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn. And uh, as you all know, that that church was pastored by our very own founder, Bishop Joseph Clemens uh, Sr. Uh, for, for more than 20 years or so, he pastored both Miracle Temple and Historic First Church. So that's where the services will be held on that Friday evening. Uh, we will be working something out for transportation, having a conversation about that, and get that information out to everyone as soon as possible, uh, those who want to uh, ride along. Um, also, that following day, which is Saturday at um, 6 o'clock p.m., uh, Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church will be having their Deacon's Appreciation Musical. And they have asked our brothers here at Miracle Temple to participate um, in singing on that evening. So our brothers will be doing two selections on that night. And we want to support that endeavor, support Shiloh Church and also our men here at Miracle Temple who will go to render service um, on that evening. Is that all right? Amen. So that's that's on that Saturday. So Friday, Bishop Sheard in Brooklyn, 
Saturdays at 6 o'clock, Shiloh Baptist Church. And then, of course, December 31st, we'll have at 10 o'clock p.m. our New Year's Eve service. Amen. At 10 o'clock p.m. Amen. And we're going to do that together. We're going to be together. And we're going to praise God um, on that night. And then leading right into the new year, I'm asking everyone to participate in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, that will begin on January 3rd until the 23rd. And uh, we will have information and a participation guide prepared for everyone so that you will have some ideas on what you can do and how you can fast um, in a successful way. And I would actually encourage everyone uh, to start fasting now um, so that way once you get to the 21 days in January, you are already built up your body and yourself so that you can start to fast then. Um, and so uh, we're not talking about a 24-hour fast, but we're talking at least intermittent fasting. Uh, so from a certain time to a certain time. And um, if you're not praying while you're fasting and reading your Bible, I will serve you notice you're really not fasting. Amen. Amen. You're only just uh, starving yourself. <laughs> Amen. But, but when you fast and you say, I'm going to push the plate back, even if it's one or two meals, and say, I'm going to push that plate back, and for that last meal of the day, maybe you say, I'm going to have some salmon and some vegetables. Uh, put that sugar out, because that'll give you a headache, um, especially if you're fasting. But put that, put that sugar aside, put that bread and all that starchy food aside, and uh, stick with some vegetables and some hearty grains. Amen. I'm talking about fasting, y'all. Uh, uh, you, 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 you do that, I can guarantee you, you'll feel a whole lot better in your body. Uh, you feel a whole lot better in your body, and uh, you might even uh, shed a few pounds uh, as you do that. Uh, but let me say, we don't fast to lose weight. If you're fasting, you're doing it for a spiritual purpose. Your motive has to be right. Um, if your motive is not right, then you, your, your fast probably won't last. <laughs> but, but if you do it for the right reasons and you really want to, and you're seeking God and you really have some prayer requests before Him, uh, the Bible is clear that God will accelerate your prayer life when you put that plate aside and you give God some time uh, throughout the day. Uh, but a lot of this information will be in that guide. Um, if you take medication and things of that sort, please take your medication, eat your food. Um, instead of eating something that's a little bit more unhealthy, perhaps maybe try something that's a little bit more healthy while you're fasting. Um, and, and that will suffice. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God bless you all today. Um, I believe that's all of the uh, particular announcements that I have right now. But please keep that in mind. All of this information is on our social media platforms. It's on our website. Um, it's also going to be in group me. So every way we can communicate with our church, we're trying to do that. Um, we, communication is important. So we want to make sure that we are doing that in a, an effective way. And so God bless you all today. It's time for the ministry of giving on today. Amen. Amen. The opportunity to give is a special one because it's a part of the worship experience. In fact, as we talk about prayer and fasting, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he deals not just with prayer and fasting, but also with giving. And so a three-fold uh, cord is not easily broken. Uh, giving, praying, and fasting. Those three things are at the core of spiritual disciplines. And they are tools, they are graces that God has given to us as believers to be strong in God and to grow in our relationship with Him. And so don't ever be afraid to give. Sometimes we give and we do it grudgingly. Um, Sometimes we don't want to give or we don't feel that we are prepared or ready to give or whatever may be the case. Um, but one of the things that I've seen in Scripture is that um, there was a woman who gave uh, all that she had. And what she had was really just a penny. But God, Jesus Christ, took that one penny and said, your faith will make you well. It has made you whole. 
Sometimes it's not in the quantity, but a lot of times it's in the quality and the heart that you do it with. And my prayer is that God will give every single one of us a heart after God. A heart that what we do, we don't do it so that we can say, don't you remember what I did for you on such and such? Now you should do such and such for me. No, if you do it in that spirit, you're not, you didn't do it for the right reason. You did it because you wanted somebody to give you something back in return. But what if we gave to God and we gave to one another out of a spirit of, I'm not looking for anything in return. I just want to do it because it's right to do. I guarantee if people in the world had that kind of mentality, it would change the world and it would flip the world upside down. Uh, so let us stand on today. As you prepare your gifts um, for, for giving on today, you have several ways that you can be a blessing to the work of the Lord. Uh, you can give through Zelle. You can give through Givelify. You can give through Cash App um, right here in the sanctuary or mail in your gifts right here to the temple at 2 Trinity Place, Norwalk, Connecticut, 06854. Amen. Um, God bless you on today. God bless you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for all of your blessings. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, because you are God all by yourself. God, and you do amazing things. Lord, you answer our prayers. You hear our prayers. You lift us up. God, there is nothing impossible for you. There is nothing that you cannot do. But God, we want to love you more. We want to love you better. We want to know what it means to be loved by you and by one another. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts. God, I pray right now that you would reach your hand out right now to that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. God, who is saying, I need help. I need help. God, you can help. And God, help us to be your hands and your feet. God, that we might be able to help them as we can. God, we praise you on today as we come giving into this ministry, into this church. God, we pray that you would bless every single person. Those who don't have to give on this occasion, we pray that you would bless them that they might be able to at another time. And God, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise belongs to you. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. God bless you. You are now in the hands of the ushers who will lead you out from the rear.
so much God loves us. He takes delight in us. He's constantly thinking about us. When we're not even thinking about God, He thinks about us. Said His thoughts of us are numerous, as numerous as the sands upon the seashore. That's a whole lot of thoughts God has for me, for you. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me.
for your glory. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to speak your word. Lord, first, I must always keep my own self clear with you, to keep my own heart clean. Lord, that anything and everything that I say, that it not come from my own selfishness, but God, that it comes from you, from the study of the word, from prayer and meditation upon you. And so, Father, I pray, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, but wash me and make me to be a vessel, God, that can be used by you. And Lord, I thank you, God, because you said that if we ask and we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, God, and you will forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. And so now, God, I pray and ask you right now, Lord God, that you would do the same for this congregation. God, that you would clean our hearts, Lord. God, that you would help us to confess our sins together and individually. God, that we might have a direct, oh God, relationship with you, unhindered, oh God. Lord, we need you today. We need you in this place. We need you in our lives. God, the spirit of apathy, the spirit of disinterest and indifference, God, that seeks to take over our lives, God, that I do not care attitude, Lord, it seeks to destroy us, it seeks to take our church under, but God, help us to care, help us to be concerned, help us, oh God, to love one another and to seek for the good in each other. But God, we pray that you would give us receptive hearts, open ears, that we would hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And I thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. While you're still standing, just one verse of Scripture. And I, I don't plan to be long on today. I want to just talk to you from this one verse um, on today. Uh, coming from the book of Matthew. The Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, the tax collector, who was one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, he, he really does a wonderful job of, of clearing up Jesus' sermon on the mount, and he outlines it very wonderfully for us. And this is a part of Jesus' sermon on the mount. So chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. Last Sunday I preached to you from verses 5 to 8, talking about praying for blessings. Uh, pray with the right motive. That's what we talked about last Sunday. But on today, we're going to actually talk about how to pray and what that looks like. And so verse 9 is where we will pick up on today. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And this is the only verse we'll read. Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. First, earlier I did not uh, say uh, thank God for my brother back there, Brother Terrence, uh, back there. He, he's got his hand up. Can we thank God for him in the house today? Amen. And our sister, Shannon, today. So glad you came, my brother. I look forward to talking with you in a few. Jesus lays out here um, what it means to pray. Last Sunday we talked about praying with the right motive. Um, and I just alluded to that earlier when I was talking about fasting because Jesus actually talks about praying and fasting with the right motive. He says in, in so many words, if you are praying to be seen by other people, you're doing it for the wrong reason. If you're living the life of a Christian so that you can gain some points or so that you can prop yourself up and you can look good to other people or to have a sense of arrival, to feel like you have arrived and you, you are, um, as it were, perfect, then Jesus is saying you have already missed the point. I think one of the problems today is that we spend a lot of time in the Bible 
But we don't spend enough time really looking at what Jesus said and what Jesus taught. I think when you read the Bible, you have to pay special attention to the words of Jesus. Jesus Christ is not only the Son of Man, that's one of the phrases that describes him in Scripture. And in fact, that's a phrase that he used for himself and it comes actually from the book of Ezekiel. Jesus in his day in the first century, ancient um, uh, Israel, they, they, they had a, the customs of the Bible or what we know today as the Bible. But then they read from the Septuagint. That was the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And they, they read from that, and that's where they had a really good understanding of what they called, Jesus actually called it, uh, the three parts of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings, or some would say the Psalms. And the Psalms comprise all of the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, so on and so forth. But Jesus, he, he took... Because he knew the word, he knew the Old Testament or what we know today as the Old Testament because he knew it so well. He was able to utilize the Old Testament to really push forward the teachings of the kingdom. Notice what Jesus was preaching and teaching was grounded in the Old Testament. So many people who look at the Old Testament and the New and they see them as different or not one cohesive whole, that's the wrong way to approach the Bible. Really, the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Paul, the apostles, so on and so forth, is just a continuation of the Old Testament. It's a continuation of what God had already done through Israel. And now God is moving in Israel in this way where it comes to its full consummation in Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to preach. I'm going to preach later on on this month about repentance. But, but right now, Jesus begins to preach this message of repentance and he says, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Ah, oh, God, I don't want to touch on that repentance right now. <laughs> but it's in my spirit right now. It's in my mind. and it, it just, It's just come to me. So I have to go with what the spirit is giving me, what I believe it's his, his spirit giving to me. But this repentance is a change of mind. It, it's a change of thinking. When, when you repent, you are in essence saying, my opinion is on the back burner and God's opinion becomes my opinion. Now that's difficult when you think about repentance because many times we don't like to talk about repentance today because we don't want to talk about our sin. And a lot of times we seek to justify ourselves and our actions and our behaviors. But what God really wants us to get down to is that the behaviors exist because of what's on the inside. Whatever is on the inside, in fact, the Pharisees came and they were mad at Jesus one day because his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate food. It was a, it was a part of the custom. You see how surface and superficial that is? Oh, you call yourself spiritual, but you don't even wash your hands. They, Jesus said, well, it's not what a man does on the outside that defiles him, it's what's on the inside. You, you understand that a lot of the problems in the world today exist because the inside is messed up. A lot of the hatred that people have, and a lot of the bigotry that exists, a lot of the racism, in fact, not even a lot, all of it. All of these things exist in the world because the inside is messed up. But what Jesus comes to do, many people thought, well, Jesus came to be a revolutionist, and he was a revolutionist. I'm about to tell you how. He was a revolutionist, but many think that he was a political revolutionist. That Jesus came to tear down the then Roman Empire and the strictures and structures of that day. But Jesus came to do something
something that was far deeper than a political assignment. Jesus said, instead, all the violence, all the evil, all of the problems of the world, how I'm going to deal with it is getting on the inside of humanity. And I'm going to transform you from the inside out. I have to deal with the root of your problem. And every single one of us in here, the root of the problem is sin. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you're going to have to sit down and really come to grips with yourself and come to grips with how you live and your decisions and your choices. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the choice. If you're going to be a person that is after God and pursuing God, every single day, you're going to have to make some choices. But you have to have some groundwork for how you're going to make choices. And you make choices based off of how you see the world. And how you see the world was shaped and influenced by how you were raised. What mama said, what daddy said, what you saw in the house as a child, that had a great deal to do with how and who you became. But, but see, that was forming you. See, I'm working on this doctoral dissertation right now, and this is what I'm talking about. So let me, can I preach my dissertation a little bit? <laughs> uh, you were formed in that way. But, but now, what Jesus has come to do is to reform you. And he does that by, he said, you must be born again. If you're going to be a person of God or a person that's seeking after God, can I tell you and dispel this now? And I say this often, God is not asking for perfection. God is asking for faithfulness. He's asking for you to be faithful to him and to commit your life to him in such a way that whatever he says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So, verse 9 here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is preaching. And he said, if you want to pray, because remember, prayer is the entryway, it's the gateway into a relationship with God. If you want to have a real relationship with God, learn how to pray. So Jesus, uh, many have called it the Lord's Prayer, but really it's a model prayer. This is not per se the Lord's Prayer in the sense that it's only His, but it is a, uh, an example for us to follow. When we pray, this is how you can do it. This is how you should do it. So, first of all, our Father in Heaven. The Father is God. Realize Jesus in his humanity is telling us something about the Godhead. Because we have always understood Jesus to be God. He is God in the flesh. So that's a kind of a complicated and difficult thing to kind of wrap the mind around. How could God be on earth but yet God is in heaven? So Jesus in his humanity, he is God fully God, fully man. Here you have, in a sense, the doctrine of the Trinity. You have the triune God who, who exists in three persons. He is one being, and you should look at person not as in the human sense, but more of consciousness. You should look at it more as personhood. A person is able to relate to other people. That's, that's why you're able to have relationships with other people because you are a person. You feel, you can, you can sense, you can hurt, you can be sad. So, so Jesus is, is this second person of the Trinity who is part of this Godhead, who is one being. So now Jesus in his humanity, God has released himself from heaven in this sense and has come down to deliver man from his sins. To, to take away the, the, the hatred, the guile, the, the racist uh, uh, ideologies, to take away all of these things from the human heart. And now he says, when you come to pray, direct your prayers to God. He's not saying to you, you don't pray to me. That's not what he said. If, you're, if you read the New Testament, you'll see 
that the believers in the early church prayed to Jesus because they understood Jesus to be God. But he's saying now you're talking to the Father. In his humanity, he subjected himself to the will of God the Father. He said, I, not my will, Father, but your will be done. In fact, John chapter 17, you should, when you get home, you should read that entire chapter. It's a prayer of Jesus, and you see Jesus talking about himself as God. But he's also praying to his Father, who is distinct from him. You all understand that? So the Father, where is he? In heaven. Throughout the Gospels, you find the writer is talking about God's location. Talking about God being in heaven. In other words, you can look at that in a few ways and you can see that God is not human. God the Father we're talking about is not human. He's not like us, but God is spirit. He's a spirit being. And he is forever and eternally existed within himself. Because he is our father in heaven, no one created him. Someone said, well, if God created us, then who created God? If he's in heaven and he is eternal, then that means he just exists. It means he just is who he is and he is immutable. That word means he can't change. self-existent being that created everything. How in the world is it that he wants to have a relationship with us? This God that created all of the world, this God who said, I took the sea and I put it in its place and I took the skyline and I drew it in the air. This God who takes the oceans everywhere that they are and separates them from the land and, and puts the sea creatures into the water and in fact they talk about sea creatures that are so big and, and so great and vicious that they're down in the bottom of the ocean itself. If that be so, God did it. God, this, this great being, in fact it was the ancient thinker Elmson who, who said that he is the greatest conceivable being. He was an ancient philosopher. The greatest conceivable being that there ever could be. Now, if God was not God and there was somebody that was greater than him, then that would be God. <laughs> that person would be God. But God in himself, he is so concrete, so solid, he knows who he is, he's not confused about his identity. You know, some of us in the church, we, we, we make God look like he's schizophrenic. <laughs> because of how we act, and how we live our lives. We say, oh, I'm a Christian, and then you go out and you do things that are just not even Christianly. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You meet people and you have an attitude and, and then you say, oh yeah, I mean, I go to such and don't tell them you go to Miracle Temple acting like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But, but sometimes we, 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 have to re we, we have to realize that who God is is who he is. And the Bible tells us about who he is. He, he is omniscient. In other words, God has all knowledge. There is nothing that God does not know. Do you know why it's so difficult for us to handle hard and challenging times in our lives? Sometimes when we meet circumstances, we don't really have a strong grounding in who God is. Now, when you can know who God is, but that doesn't mean it takes away the pain. I, I was just telling you a minute ago, I lost my, my God sister. I cannot even begin to tell you how close we were. I cannot begin to tell you how much I love my God sister. In fact, she just sent me a message just a couple weeks ago and, and, and we were talking and in fact, there was another sister back in Buffalo that died and she sent me uh, the message that she had passed. And we started to talk about her and you know, her personality and things like that. And I said to her, I said, you know, whenever God called me out of here, I said, I want y'all to have church. 
And we were just talking. I said, I want y'all to dance and shout because I got victory. And she said, you know, they called me Bishop. That's what my family called me. She said, Bishop, you're going to be around a long time. She said, you're going to be around a long time, she said, but because you got to be our presiding bishop one day. <laughs> and so I say that to just say it hurt my heart to the core to hear that she was gone. Forty years old, gone. I could not believe it. It took me a minute when my grandmother called me and said that she was gone. I said, who? And all week I've been dealing with that grief of that loss. But what can help you in hard times is having the reminder of who God is. When you can remember that God has all knowledge, that means you may not have all knowledge, but he does. And there are some things that happen today, you don't understand why it happens today, but in 10, sometimes 15, 20 years down the line, you remember and you think, my God, I see why that happened the way it did. Sometimes you even see some of the decisions and choices that you made, and you say, oh my God, I can't believe how that choice landed me where it is. But like the song said earlier, all those choices, all those decisions, they have done something. They made you wiser. <laughs> they made you better. You might have some regrets along the way, but you can look back and say, God, you were with me then, and you're with me now. But when you pray, you are addressing the Father. When you address God who is in heaven, this eternal being, this great being, you don't just come to God any kind of way. You come with respect. You come with reverence. You come with a sense of awe. Don't you remember the book of Proverbs says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God? See, that word fear is not talking about being scared of God. It's talking about reverence. Talking about worshipful fear. Talking about, you know, one of the reasons why some folk, uh, they have some, some kind of, you know, issues sometimes. And, they, and some folk, uh, and I'm not just talking about the church, I'm talking about in general. They have no respect for other people. And sometimes that's because they really don't have a fear. They have, they have, they have no fear for God. Listen, if you have fear for God, I guarantee you, you respect other people. You, you'll treat other people right. See, if you want to have a relationship with God, it's going to be, like John said, if you say that you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar. I didn't say that. John said that. When you have a relationship with God, you come respectful. But yet, you can come honest. You can be transparent with God. Jesus said, our Father in heaven, here's the respect, hallowed. Hallowed. Hallowed be your name. Listen, that word hallowed is holy. I am, when I come to God, I am sanctifying or I'm setting apart his name as holy. I, I am respecting who he is and yet, as I respect who he is, I'm also worshiping and praising him for who he is. Listen, our Father who is in heaven, when you come to pray, you begin, God, I love you. God, I praise you. God, I adore you. God, there is no one like you in all of the earth. You might have your own words that you want to say to God in that moment, but whatever it is, if you want to learn how to pray, how to connect with God, start with respect. Start with worship. Start with holiness. In fact, the Bible tells us that the angels in heaven even they right now are crying before the throne of God, holy. The angels, can you just imagine that in your mind? The angels of God, sometimes I look at angels and I think, oh my God, they're more than six foot, seven foot, eight foot tall and big uh, uh, wings and all these things. And the Bible talks about the angels, they have those, 
they have the, the wings, the seraphim have the great wings and with, with two they cover their face and with two they cover their body. My God. Can you see it in your mind that these angels take all of the wings and they fly around the throne of God and they cry holy. Every single time you cry holy to God, you are joined in the chorus of angels. And you're worshiping and fearing him and saying of him how great he is. So if you want to learn how to pray, begin with praise. Begin with worship. Never enter into the presence of God without being thankful. Without saying, I have gratitude for what you have done in my life. If you can learn how to be great, grateful for what God has done in your life and who he is to you, I can guarantee you it will change your outlook on life. It will change how you see yourself when you begin to see God as holy. In fact, there was one theologian who said, if you're going to know God, you have to know yourself. <laughs> Know thyself to know thy God. What does that mean? If you're going to be with God, if you're going to be in his presence, have a relationship with him every single day. That means when God shows you who he is, you have to look how much you pale in comparison to him. God being the all-wise all-knowing God, the changeless God, the, the powerful God who in himself, he does not depend on us to be who he is. He does not depend on human beings to be who he is. But who he is is so great and so miraculous and immaculate that he has decided, I'm going to create human beings. And he does not create us as puppets. He does not create us as robots. He creates us with free will. This great God who can do anything he wants creates us to choose whatever we want. But yet he's so great he holds us accountable for our choices. God is good. <laughs> So one might say, well, what does that mean that God is good? How, how is God good? I'm done. How, how, how is God good? Well, God is good because goodness is who he is. Goodness is in God's DNA, as it were. It's in his very being. Just like the Bible says, God is love. God is just good. In fact, there is no evil in him at all. My God. Amen. In fact, the Bible says that God, he can't even do evil because he's not evil. So he's not going to tempt you to do evil. No, if you're tempted, it's because it's something in you that you're lusting after. It's something that you want. But what God does is he comes into our lives and he changes our desires. And he says, I want to give you my desires. I want you to fill my heart. I want you to have the heartbeat of God, as it were. I want you to know how much I love you. And then once you find out and you begin to learn about how much I love you, then you begin to live your life based on how much I love you. No longer will you live your life with this sense of low self-esteem or feeling that you're not good enough. It's not about you being good enough. Amen. God sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to be good enough. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, because he was good now, if you come into him, the Bible says that he gives you his goodness. Isn't that a powerful thing? That the God of the universe, the God that tell us that this is just one galaxy that the earth is in. This is just one galaxy, one sun that lights up the earth and gives, uh, uh, as it were, light to all of the planets in this orbit. But there's a whole nother galaxy out there. In fact, they say there's millions of them. Who knows what's out there? But let me tell you, there's a dark hole out there too. 
They say there's a big dark hole that it's sucking up the universe, pulling it into itself, taking galaxies into it. Well, I want you to know today that the God that we serve is so great that he even made the big black hole. <laughs> Pluto and Mars and Jupiter, Saturn and Venus, all of them belong to him. He said, I took the sun and I put it in the sky so that it can give you light during the day. And if you get out there walking it long enough, you'll get some vitamin D. Hallelujah. Amen. Then he said, I'm going to take the moon and I'm going to put that out there. So at nighttime, it'll light up the sky. Then he said, I'll take the stars and sprinkle them across the sky. We can't even go outside at nighttime and see the stars because we got all these lights down here. And they mess up the view. But if you can only see God, if you could imagine how great he is, how powerful he is, don't you know your life will change. Stand to your feet. Not only will your life change, but your prayer life will change. Your prayer life will be of such that it will have such power, such connection with God. God said, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. God wants a relationship with us today. Every day I'm asking God, Lord, I want to know you better. I want to know you more. All the trouble in life, all the pains, all the temptations, everything that comes, God, I want to know you better. I want to have a relationship with you. And I want to know at the end of the day that you love me. I know what it means to live life and feel like nobody loves you. Feel like you don't have a friend in the world. I've been there. I've gone through that. Everybody depending on you. Everybody looking to you to help them. And then you say, well, who's going to help me? Amen. You know, my wife and I, we have this little joke between us. And I'm going to share it. <laughs> And then we're going to pray. <laughs> but uh, one, one day, some years ago, my wife, she said, I'm tired. Will you pick me up and carry me into the house? <laughs> and I said, well, if I pick you up, who's going to pick me up? <laughs> I said, somebody got to carry both of us. I'm trying to get there too. And every, every now and then she'll come back and she'll say, will you carry me? And I'll say, but I'm glad to tell you all on today that we have a God who's carrying all of us. He's carrying nothing impossible for him. Nothing too big for him. He loves us. God, we thank you right now. Lord God, because you love us. Lord, you care about us. And God, you have given yourself for us. You sent your son into the world who pre-existed in heaven with you. And you sent him into the earth so that he might take on human flesh. And that he would die as a sinless, spotless sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. But God, that blessing of his death and resurrection can only be allocated to us when we believe. When we repent and we believe in you, 
Lord, you promise, God, that you will wipe away our tears, you will take away our sins, and you will wash us and cleanse us and make us righteous. Lord, none of us are here perfect. None of us have arrived. We all are still dealing with various things in our lives. Therefore, God, we will not treat each other as if we are better. We won't look at each other and have this look of distaste toward each other because, God, you are God to all of us. And Lord, you said in your word, God, that you are working for our good. Lord, someone came into this house today hurt, disappointed, afraid, abused. But God, you are the healer of our lives. You're the healer of our diseases. You are the healer of our hearts. Look on us today, Father. That man, that woman, that boy, that girl that's watching or that's in this house today that does not know you, oh God, I pray that you would reach into their heart, forgive them of their sins, Lord, and give them the blessed assurance that you are theirs and that they are yours. God, we thank you right now. All you have to do, man, all you have to do, woman, is repent. Confess your sins to him. And he said, I'm faithful and just, and I'll forgive you of your sins, and I'll cleanse you. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah said that God would take away your stony heart, that hard heart, and he'll replace it and give you a heart of flesh. It'll be soft, it'll be gentle, it'll be pliable, teachable. It'll listen to other folks. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for doing it right now. And we praise you, Lord. So God, now as we get ready to go before your table and to partake in the Lord's Supper, God, we, we pray, oh God, today that you will be glorified in us. That you will forgive us of all of our sins. Wash us, oh God. Here we are, Lord. We, we're sorry for everything that we've done and all that we've been against you. Lord, even David, when he sinned with Bathsheba and he committed adultery with her and he, and he had her husband Uriah killed, he came back to you when Nathan brought his sins to him and said it was against you and you only have our sin and done this evil. But God, you're so gracious and merciful that you forgive us. And God, you have proven your love for us and Jesus Christ dying for us, taking our place and saying, now are you the sons of God? Because you have believed in me, whom the Father has sent. I rose from the dead just for you. And God, as Jesus has risen, so will we. Death is not the end for us. We'll rise again. Yes. And so God, we thank you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us prepare for communion. Our brothers will come. The elders will come and take the table out for us and take their places. And now I'm going to ask also if the ushers will also prepare themselves to let the people of God come out from the rear of the sanctuary. Praise our God. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh.
Jesus took the cup after he had supped, saying, This cup is my blood. In the New Testament, as often as you drink it and you eat this cup from this bread, you show forth my death until I come again. Let us all drink together. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up a praise and worship in this house. Come on, let's lift up a praise and worship. Come on, come on, you just ate and drank healing into your body. Hallelujah. You just ate and drank prosperity into your body. Come on, hallelujah. Yeah. 
Tell somebody about it. Again, our pastor, thank you again for awesome, awesome work. Continue let God use you. Let us pray. What a mighty God. What an awesome God. Eternal and gracious God, we thank you. God, we thank you, oh God, for this another opportunity, dear Lord, to just come and live your holy name. God, we thank you, oh God, for the word that you have sent forth this morning, God. We thank you for our leader. Father, that we ask, dear Lord, when we get this word, oh God, let us not just keep it to ourselves, oh God. Let us take it out of this temple and tell somebody how wonderful, how sweet you are. Father, that we ask, dear Lord, to help us, protect us, and be with us, oh God. Remove sickness and pain from our body, oh God. And Father God, be with us throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout this year. And Father God, help us to be back into your house at another time. In your gracious and precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Mr. Pennant.